Good morning. Whoa. <laughs> Welcome to Asbury. Today is Sunday. Today is Sunday. Okay, let's try this again. Okay. Good morning. Is this better? Welcome to Asbury. Today is Sunday, February the 27th. Can you believe that February is almost over? We are so glad that you're worshiping with us today, whether in person, on live stream, Facebook, or the radio. Uh, we're going to welcome today Kevin Morrison, Green County Mayor Kevin Morrison, is going to be giving our message today. So you all make sure that he gets an Asbury welcome when it comes that time. So now I ask that you stand and join us in our opening hymn of Stand Up and Bless the Lord, page 662, verses 1 through 5. Good morning. I'm going to tell a story today, but I'm going to need your help. And congregation, if you want to help us out too with these sound effects, we'd love to have you. So I'm going to start the story, and you need to pay attention because the first sound effect I need is blowing wind. The second one is raindrops falling. The third one is the sound an owl makes. Then we need to make a tick-tock sound of a clock, then a trombone. So those are our sounds, okay? It was a dark and stormy night. Timmy was spending the night at his Aunt Lindy's apartment. Aunt Lindy had just tucked Timmy in and turned off the light when Timmy could hear the wind blowing outside. Raindrops fell against the window. Timmy was starting to feel a little uneasy then he heard an owl hooting. Tommy pulled the covers all the way up to his chin. Then he heard the old grandfather clock outside in the hall. 
Everything sounded so strange in this strange place. Even Aunt Linda. Timmy could hear her in the next room playing some strange song on her trombone. <laughs> Worst of all, there was a lump in the floor. Timmy couldn't figure out what it was, but that lump combined with all the strange sounds was too much. He sat up in the bed and yelled out, Aunt Lindy, Aunt Lindy! Immediately, the trombone stopped. And Aunt Lindy ran into Timmy's room. She turned on the light. Timmy, what's wrong? She asked. Timmy told her about the strange noises and the lump on the floor. The lump on the floor, she asked. Then they both looked over to the floor. And with the light on, they could see it was really just a pile of her dirty socks. Timmy and Aunt Linda giggled a little. She turned back to Timmy and said, it's okay to be scared. We all get scared sometimes. One of the things that makes us feel better is praying. It's the one way that I remember, even when I get scared, that God is with me. So, Timmy, here's a little prayer, and I want you to repeat it after, line after me. So, I'm going to say this prayer now, and you repeat it after me, okay? Thank you, God. For wrapping me in a blanket of your care. Thank you, God, for caressing me with the nightlight of your grace. Thank you, God, for soothing me with the lullaby of your love. Amen. After they prayed, Aunt Lindy asked, can I get you anything? A glass of water, maybe? Timmy smiled. He said, no, I'm fine, and I think I'm ready to go to sleep. So Aunt Lindy gave him a big hug and turned out the light as she left his room. Timmy then said the prayer again that his aunt taught him. As he closed his eyes, he could still hear the same sounds he had before. The wind was still blowing. The raindrops kept tapping on the window. The owl kept hooting, and the grandfather clock kept tick-tocking. But none of those sounds bothered him anymore. He knew what they were, and they even seemed soothing now. And the strangest sound of them all, Aunt Lindy's trombone was playing. (laughs) That was the most soothing sound now to Timmy. Timmy wasn't sure how he was hearing things correctly, but it sounded like she was trying to play a lullaby, like Twinkle, Twinkle, Little Star. And within minutes, little Timmy fell asleep. Snoring sounds. (laughs) Good job. So this tells us that when we get afraid, Who should we talk to to make us feel better? Jesus. And how do we talk to Jesus and God? We pray. So let's say this prayer one more time, okay? Thank you, God, for wrapping me in the blanket of your care. Thank you, God, for caressing me with the nightlight of your grace. Thank you, God, for soothing me with the lullaby of your love. Amen. Now, one more thing before we go. So, Ash Wednesday starts this Wednesday. So, I have here, and each of you all will get one of these today. And any other families that would like to have one of these, just let me know. And I'll have it ready for you to pick up. This, you've heard of an Advent calendar, right? Well, this is a Lenten calendar. It starts down here when baby Jesus was born. And you follow it all the way up to Easter. And it's called Eyes on Jesus. And you scratch off each day and there is a scripture there. So, parents, I encourage you to do this with your child each day, whether it's morning or night. Uh, But they will come home with these today and a little information sheet. 
But I think it's going to be lots of fun to keep our eye on Jesus the next 40 days starting Wednesday. Okay? Have a good week. Good morning. And now as we enter into a time of prayer, I ask that you remember Kip Cash, Victoria Everett, Cecil Hankins, Jim Sterling, Trey Youngblood, and the families of Reverend Norman Wilhoyt, Zachary Cosby, and Susan Barkley. Now if you'll please enter into a time of prayer with me. To you, O oh Lord, we pray. Answer us with your mercy. Almighty, all merciful God, lover of justice and giver of peace, hear our prayer. For your people, for the Church of Jesus Christ, and for all who seek your face. Do not turn away from us, but reveal yourself in all your splendor. Almighty God, answer us with your mercy. For the leaders of the Church, that they may be faithful to your call and obedient to your leading. Almighty God, hear our prayer. For the leader of the nations of the world, that they may work for the common good of all people, that they may repent, repent of transgressions and lay down their tools of destruction. Almighty God, hear our prayer. For the people in the middle of war-stricken land, that you may protect the weak, thwart the unjust aggression on the innocent, and create in us a conviction to end the violence against our neighbors. Lord, have mercy. Christ, have mercy. For those who are sick or in trouble, for the defenseless, the weak, and the poor, that they may find help in the time of need, and that the church may heed their cry. Almighty God, hear our prayer. Let our lives and our world be transfigured by your glory and transformed by your love. In the name of Jesus Christ, your chosen one, our Lord. And now we pray as one, as you taught your disciples, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Good morning. It is good to see everyone today. If the service ended at the moment, I would consider myself richly blessed. Kids, you've done an excellent job. If I could get the county commission to behave so uh, eloquently. And uh, Kim and Natasha, I'm counting on you perhaps to bring members of the choir down at our next meeting to perhaps make some, uh, make some joyful noise for us. 
It is indeed a great honor to be here today. My title from Caesar is that I'm your county mayor. But what I really am is a sinner. That's the reason I'm here. My faith journey is this. My home church had received a new pastor in 2002, and he was engaged in some classes, and he asked me if I would be willing. He asked my mother-in-law and myself if we would be interested in perhaps doing some lay speaking work so that the congregation would receive a worship message for when he had to be away and in school. That was a calling that neither of us took lightly. And that began my faith journey to the point that today I serve somewhat as the associate pastor in the Bailenton United Methodist Circuit to Pastor Greg Davis. But I am a sinner, and that's the reason I'm here. That's the reason I want to be here in God's house with God's people on God's day. And perhaps bring to you just a little message from Psalm 51, verse 1 through 17, about the joy of salvation. A story that we can all relate to. And if you would like to follow along, uh, before I begin, I would ask for a special prayer for a friend of mine. A, a great guy here in our community that does a lot of good work, and that would be Trey Youngblood. He had a horrible accident on Friday. He continues to improve. He has a long road to go, but please be much in prayer for my friend. Psalm 51, verse 1 through 17. And for those that are able, let us stand for when we read God's word. For this is what it says. Have mercy upon me, O God, according to thy loving kindness. According unto the multitude of thy tender mercies, blot out all of my transgressions. Wash me thoroughly from mine iniquity and cleanse me from my sin. For I acknowledge my transgression and my sin is ever present before me. Against thee and thee only have I sinned and done this evil in thy sight, that thou mightest be justified when thou speakest and be clear when thou judgest. Behold, I was shapen in iniquity, and in sin did my mother conceive me. Behold, thou desirest truth in the inward parts, and in the hidden parts thou shalt make me to know wisdom. Purge me with hyssop, and I shall be clean. Wash me, and I shall be whiter than snow. Make me to hear joy and gladness, that the bones which thou hast broken may rejoice. Hide thy face from my sins, and blot out all of mine iniquities. Create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a right spirit within me. Cast me not away from thy presence, and take not thy Holy Spirit from me. But restore unto me the joy of my salvation, and uphold me with thy free spirit. Then will I teach transgressors thy ways, and sinners shall be converted unto thee. Deliver me from blood guiltiness, O God. Thou God of my salvation, and my tongue shall sing aloud of thy righteousness. O Lord, open thou my lips, and my mouth shall spew forth thy praises. For thou desirest not sacrifice, else I would give it. Thou delightest not in burnt offerings. The sacrifices of God are a broken spirit, a broken and contrite heart, O God, and thou wilt not despise. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Please be seated. This here is a psalm of confession. And here is an inside view of a man getting right with God. It's the bearing of a man's heart after an encounter with failure. David had cast away his salvation. It is also a psalm of the king. David, you see, is the leader he is the leader politically. He is the leader spiritually. He is even the leader musically. He comes from great courage, possesses great wisdom and ability and, and talent. It is a psalm with which we can all identify because we have all failed at some particular point in time in our life. 
We all come short of the glory of God, Romans chapter 3, verse 23 tells us. But I want to focus on just one statement, just one verse there in verse 12 that says that restore unto me the joy of thy salvation and uphold me with thy free spirit. David had known the joy of salvation. And restore here in verse 12 indicates that he had possessed it before. And the search of the Psalms will reveal this truth unto us. If you go into the earlier Psalms before Psalm 51 in Psalm 9 verse 1, David says, I will give thanks to you, Lord, with all my heart, and I will tell you of all of your wonderful deeds. Psalm 21 verse 1 says that, the king rejoices in your strength, Lord, and how great is his joy in the victories in which you give. Even Psalm 23, verse 5, which we are all familiar with, says that you prepare a table before me in the presence of mine enemies. You anoint my head with oil, my cup overflows, indicating great blessings. Even in Psalm 34, verse 1, I will extol the Lord at all times, and his praise will always be on my lips. So there are greater times proven and recorded where David had enjoyed the, the salvation of his soul. But now he is asking here in chapter 51 to restore the joy of his salvation. And there is a good reason for all of this joy that we just read about in these earlier psalms, and that is the joy of forgiveness. There is great joy in forgiveness. And that is one of the most difficult things that any of us will do or be asked to do. And that is to forgive someone who has wronged us in some form or fashion. Someone who has, we feel, cheated or infringed upon our, our ego. But the Bible tells us that if we can't forgive, then we cannot be forgiven. There is the joy of the assurance of heaven. This is a magnificent house of God with a rich and storied history. I get lost in its passageways. I came over to do a little walkthrough on earlier this week. And I found it much easier just to go out the front door and walk around the whole building than I did to go back through these passageways. But there is the joy of the assurance of heaven. And what I mean is that all of this will disappear. All of it will disappear. This is only temporary. I'm just here for a little while. I know when we had an employee that recently passed away and one of the students up at Greenville High School that passed away and we had a, a service for them at the impact center there was one of the Pentecostal pastors come up and he unrolled this rope and the rope disappeared behind the behind the curtain of the stage and and went off over the steps and on the end that one of the students was holding was a small strip of white cloth or white tape and the preacher said, this is the portion of your life while you're here. This represents the, the sum of everything that you will do, everything that you will become, all that you will accumulate in this one little portion. But what God's grace and mercy has granted is the rest of it. And it disappears into eternity. And that's the part that should be the most important. But we only receive that assurance when we're washed in the blood. The joy of the presence of the Lord is a good reason for the joy of salvation. That's what you feel sitting here in this magnificent house of God. Where one or more are gathered, there I am also. He is here in our presence today. And we are greatly assisted if we are walking hand in hand with him every day. I can't do anything without him 
holding my hand. I can't breathe. I'm not guaranteed the next breath, just the one I'm holding. But there is great joy in being in the presence of God. There is great joy in finding the answer to life, which is what the Pentecostal pastor was trying to tell the attendants at the impact center. It made a great impression on me that this is the sum total of everything that I would become, everything that I would do, every, every contribution I would make, everything that I would accumulate, but the rest, the rest is finding the answer to life, life everlasting. Jesus told his disciples, and it was for us, that I go to prepare a place for you, that house not made with hands eternal in the heavens, and I will return for you. That wasn't a suggestion. That's a promise. And we need to be living every day for that promise. And those joys are available to each and every one here in this congregation through the gospel of Jesus Christ found in his precious holy words. But David, he had known the joy of his salvation and apparently lost it. He had lost the joy of his salvation because restore there in verse 12 indicates that he doesn't have it right now. And David has a lot of company. It seems like life has gotten much more difficult over the last couple of years. The uncertainty of tomorrow seems to be much further away than it once was. We have a lot of people around us that are suffering with disease and affliction, suffering with addiction and financial issues. And David has a lot of company because many are filled with gloom who were once filled to the rim with glory. Many people are burdened who were once felt that they were greatly blessed. Many are sour in some ways that were once filled with song. And many people around us that were once praising are now somewhat pouting. So what is the backstory of David and his sin? What is the perspective here? Well, that story can be found in 2 Samuel chapter 11 and 12. David sends his army and he sends the nation of Israel off to fight the people of Ammon. And he sends his general Joab out to fight while David sort of lingers back at the rear. That's military parlance for, for being not up near the fighting, but being back where all the creature comforts were. And he's back there in the rear, and he, he gets up from his bed, and he goes to the rooftop, and he looks out over the vista of his kingdom, and he sees a beautiful young lady taking a bath. And in that moment, he asks a staff member, who is that beautiful lady down there that I see? And the staff member says, that is Uriah the Hittite. He's one of your commanders, and that's his wife. And David sends yet another staff member of his down to her house to bring her back to the palace. And I'm sure he lavishes her with, with great gifts, and he ends up sleeping with her and having an adulterous affair with her. And she conceives a child. And to add insult to injury, David then continues to fall into the trap, fall into the abyss of sin. Now he is having a child out of wedlock that some in the kingdom now know about. Well, what am I going to do? Well, he devises this plan. He sends word to his general Joab in the field to send Uriah back to the rear. I want to talk to him. And Uriah comes back and he has this conversation with him. Well, how is everybody doing up there? How is the war going? 
Well, thank you for this update. How is, how is General Joab getting along? Well, thank you for that update. Now, I want you to, to rest a little while. And David, what David was hoping for was that he would go and he would go back to his house and he would start enjoying the comforts of life again because he was back where he could get hot food and he could get a bath and he could see his wife. And he would sleep with her and it would cover up the fact that now she was having a child that wasn't his. But that's not what happened, did it? There is a great tradition in the military from which I got a bunch of my training. And when we were called to the rear, particularly when the, when the rest of the unit was in the field, we didn't enjoy any creature comforts. And that's exactly what Uriah did. Instead of, instead of going to his house and in enjoying life as the psalm records or as Samuel records, he slept at the doorway of the king's palace. And David tried to ply him with all measures of comforts. He, he, he set out a great meal. But that didn't matter to Uriah. He slept and he was asked, well, why didn't, why didn't you go back to your house? David asked him that. And he said, well, Israel and all the generals and all the commanders are out in the field under the stars and they're in misery. And who am I to enjoy the creature comforts while I'm back here? They can't see their family and I'm not going to try to see mine. But that angered David greatly. The next day he tried to get him drunk and ply him with alcohol. That didn't work either. So then David, to again add insult to injury and go further down into the abyss of sin and cast away the joy of his salvation decides to write a letter a death warrant and he sends it to general joab in the field and says that when uriah gets back i want you to stick him in the midst of the battle against the most courageous of the enemy so that he will die and that's exactly what happened Uriah was killed. And after the battle, and the news was delivered back to the, to the wife that her husband had been killed, and the mission had been accomplished for King David, and we, we successfully got rid of this, this man for you. Only your sins will find you out. The prophet Nathan comes in and says to David, I know what you did. You conceived this child out of wedlock with another man's wife. You sought to cover it up. And he tells him a parable of a rich man and a poor man. And how the rich man cheats the poor man out of everything. And David becomes very mad and Nathan tells him, you're that man. To keep a long story a little bit short, the child that was conceived in the adulterous affair dies. David spends several days on his knees begging God to save this child. But at the end, when the child dies and David is notified, David lifts himself up by the bootstraps realizing what he had done, that he had cast away the joy of his salvation. Because sin and continued sin and piling on had robbed David of his joy. And sin can rob all of us of our salvation. It can rob us of our financial security, our mental stability, our physical health, our personal standing with others. It'll take everything. The devil has sharp claws. 1 Peter chapter 5, verse 8 tells us to be alert and of sober mind for your enemy the devil prowls around like a roaring lion looking for someone to devour. But many, like David, the song was gone. He had cast it away himself. He had become his own worst enemy. He had thrown it away. 
And many around us can remember a better day. David remembered a better day, and he longed to have the joy of his salvation restored. Restored was part of his prayer here in Psalm 51 to get back what he had lost. David had been a disciplined leader. He had been disciplined in rule. He had been disciplined in courage. He had been disciplined in faith. He had been disciplined to God, and he had been greatly blessed by God. And the pain of discipline is nothing compared to the pain of disappointment. So David prays for his joy to come back again. But what was the road back? What is the road back for those who have cast away or lost the joy of their salvation? It is the road of remembering. It is the road of confession. It is the road of faith. Personally, I might advise that you turn to Psalm chapter 23. The Lord is my shepherd. Because I can promise you, if the Lord is your shepherd, you will not want for anything. He restoreth. He maketh me to lie down in green pastures. He leadeth me beside the still waters. When God holds your hand, you will not have to worry about the grass being greener on the other side. You will not have to worry about the comforts that you will receive or, or get. And he will calm the raging waters of life. He restoreth my soul. He leadeth me in the paths of righteousness for his namesake. Whenever we have failed, God can restore your soul. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for thou art with me. Thy rod and thy staff, they comfort me. God gives us great tools to protect ourselves. The armor of God, and we should put it on every day. And if we haven't walked through the valley of the shadow of death the last two or three years, I don't know where we were. But he will protect you. Thou preparest a table before me in the presence of mine enemies. Thou anointest my head with oil, my cup runneth over. We have a tendency as a fallen race to enumerate all of our problems and our challenges. And we set aside and we don't necessarily count our blessings of health and wealth and welfare. And all of those things that we take for granted. We take for granted today that the Lord woke us up. Chaplain Danny Ricker that serves as our chaplain in Greene County, I talk to him regularly. Danny comes by. And he says, the first thing I do, Mayor, when I get out of bed is to thank God that he woke me up. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life. And like the rope, if we are focused on the right part then we can dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Collectively, as a, as a community, we might refer to 2 Chronicles chapter 7, verse 14, which says, If my people, which are called by my name, shall humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then will I hear from heaven. And I will forgive them of their sin and I will heal their land. Just two little suggestions there on the long road back to the joy of salvation that we can have it. I challenge you today sometime in the silence of your meditation to look at Psalm 32 which is another view of the same man. It says, blessed is the man whose transgression is forgiven. Ask yourself what has been your failure, your mistake that threatened or took away the joy of your salvation. Because I guarantee it's there. It's there for me. Many times over. Many times over. And your joy will return as you return to your Lord like David did confessing your sins. We all have a great lesson in guarding our salvation. Don't cast it away. 
Don't let anyone or anything tempt you or try to steal it. In a moment of counting your blessings, the end of the story is this. As Paul Harvey liked to say, the rest of the story. Even after great heartache, the loss of a child, the compounded sin of killing a father, a husband, a great leader. Even after all of this, in this moment of great failure of David, would come a great blessing from God. After Uriah Bathsheba would become the legitimate wife of David. And she would conceive another son. And his name was Solomon. And when on David's passing, at the end of Psalms and at the beginning of Kings, in 1 Kings chapter 3 verse 5, it says this, At Gibeon the Lord appeared to Solomon during the night in a dream, and God said, Ask for what you want, and I will give it to you. There are many people that would love for God to say that to them. But we, most of us, me included, would probably end up asking for exactly the wrong thing. Solomon, of course, asked for wisdom. And this was God's answer a little further over into chapter 3. Verse 12 says that I will do what you have asked, God says. That I will give you a wise and discerning heart. So that there will never have been anyone like you, nor will there ever be. Moreover, I will give you what you did not ask for. I will give you both wealth and honor. So that in your lifetime, you will have no equal among any of the kings. And if you walk in obedience to me and keep my decrees and commands as David your father has done, then I will give you a long life. As fallen people, our joy of salvation can be somewhat tenuous. Like the trials and things of life, sometimes it is always darkest before the sunrise. I want to leave you with this verse from Psalms chapter 30, verse 5, which says, Sing praises to the Lord, O you saints, and give thanks to his holy name, for his anger is but for a moment, and his favor is is for a lifetime. Weeping may tarry for the night, but joy cometh in the morning. Let us pray. Most gracious and loving Heavenly Father, we thank you for these few minutes that we've been gathered here together. Father God, we thank you for this great congregation and this wonderful house of God. Father God, that we could be here this day in your house with your people. Most especially, Father God, we thank you for your benevolence, the the great blessings of health, wealth, and welfare, and all those things that we take for granted. We most especially thank you for the blood of your Son, Jesus Christ, poured out for us, for, for without it there is no other way. Father God, this, this would be it. Father God, we just ask that as we go forward here into this week that you rekindle, you rekindle the discipline that we need to preserve and protect and defend the joy of our salvation. Father God, for that was, an, that was an invitation paid for in breath and blood. Father God, it, as we go our own separate ways, we just ask that you bring us back at the next appointed hour, whenever that may be, and we will continue to give you all of the honor, the praise, and the glory forever. And all of God's children would say, Amen. Amen.
Okay, now uh, I want you to think about how you can give your gifts and talents to the good of Asbury, and the choir is going to play our offertory for us. Now please stand and join us in our closing hymn, Savior, again to thy dear name, hymnal number 663, verses 1 and 2.
couple of announcements. Um, this week's meal is spaghetti, salad, and bread, and dessert is provided by the children. So if you'd like to join us for our fundraiser meal, make your reservation by noon on Tuesday. And the prom closet is coming up. And I'm not sure if you've heard or not, but Apex Bank is partnered with uh, Asbury Family Ministries, and they are donating $500 to cover the first 50 dresses that are purchased that day. So there'll be more about that in the paper, and they're also providing a goodie bag for each of the 50 girls that get those first 50 dresses. Uh, they'll be here Tuesday to present us with the check, and we're gonna have several of the UMW ladies that were here when we started that prom closet 16 years ago. Of course, Miss Barbara Lawson was the spearhead of that ministry, and we are so thankful for what she did for that, but to think that we've been providing prom dresses for those who need it for 16 years, that's amazing. Um, and also coming up Tuesday, uh, the youth are having a Shrove Tuesday fundraiser. As I said earlier, Lent starts Wednesday, so come on down for Fat Tuesday and have pancakes and enjoy some games. It's gonna be pancakes, sausage, homestyle potatoes, and it's by donation only, and that starts at 5.30. And then uh, if you're a third, fourth, or fifth grader, you'll be getting information in the mail. We're gonna start on March the 13th uh, doing how to use our Bible, learning to use our Bible with our third, fourth, and fifth graders and their mentors. Or if any adults just wanna join us, we'd love to have you. We start that on the 13th at 5 p.m. in the fellowship hall. So now go into the world and share the love of Jesus Christ and make disciples of Jesus.